Um, and I, I wanted to spend the last seven minutes uh, <laughs> on... I hope that wasn't directed at me. Um, the last seven minutes, just talking about the work we do engaging with, with companies that we hold in our portfolio. And just as, a, as, as an aside, there is a, a sustained kind of regulatory push and quasi-regulatory push to get investors to be more responsible owners of businesses that they invest in. Um, in the UK, we have something called the Stewardship Code, which is a, it's a, a, it's a sort of, qua it's not a regulation, but it's basically a comply or explain a provision. You either comply with the Stewardship Code or you explain why you don't. And basically, everyone has complied with the Stewardship Code, so it makes it rather difficult to explain <laughs> why you haven't. So basically, everyone complies with the Stewardship Code. Um, and that, that, that basically is a code that um, asset managers, so people who manage um, investment products, uh, sign up to, and it commits them to um, engaging with and, and being better stewards of, um, of the, the, the shareholdings that they have in big companies. And then the other thing which I think is significant in this regard is something called the UN PRI, the Principles for Responsible Investment, which is a very, very widely... Uh, supported uh, set of principles. Uh, there are trillions of dollars worth of money now uh, managed by businesses that are signed up to the UNPRI. So it's a very significant uh, feature of this landscape. And, um, and that too encourages uh, investors to... <laughs> it's a bit distracting, isn't it? I think, I think I noticed on the door of that thing earlier that they're doing some auditions for something. So all I'm hoping is they've now announced the shortlist and they'll stop whooping and cheering in a minute. Okay. But well done, Seb, for keeping going, <laughs> yes, uh, notwithstanding. Uh, <laughs> I shall plough on anyway. They're so, enjoying uh, you so much. They're cheering <laughs> your every sure word. <laughs> Um, I'd like to think that was the case. Um, so anyway, so this is just, just to give you a bit of background around, you know, it's not just web that is doing this. It's really a very widely um, held principle that, that investors, particularly in the UK, but, but globally as well, do need to engage with companies and indeed are beginning to engage much more with, with companies. From our perspective, we, we see it as actually creating value for us. The first way is by talking to companies about... ESG issues, that's environmental, social, and governance issues. We learn something about those management teams. We, we, we can see how they respond to issues and how they deal with those issues. And we think we learn something useful from that experience that gives us a sense of the quality of the management team that we're thinking about investing in or, or do invest in. But there are also two outputs from this process. The first is by engaging companies, we think we're helping them become better investments. And I'll, I'll talk about the work we've been doing on chemicals in a second. But the other thing is actually that our investors really like us doing this. They like seeing us uh, engage with companies to push for more progressive policies uh, from the companies that we invest in. Not, not all our investors, in, in all honesty, but a lot of them do. Uh, and it's quite an important part now of, of what we consider to be our role. Um, so then just turning to this, the, the SIN list, which we've been using uh, to help inform our engagement, um, as I mentioned, both, uh, you can probably just see them there, I've circled Johnson, Matthey, and Umicore. Um, they are both on, on the SIN list. Um, they're not, well, Umicor do have rather, no, rather a lot of SIN list uh, substances, in part because they're recycling all these uh, slimes and sludges. But nonetheless, they are both very much there and have issues to deal with. Um, so we use this as a, as a sort of tool to help us focus the conversation with those businesses. You know, we, weren't, we, we didn't know that they had this exposure until the SIN list was produced. Uh, so this was new information for us, uh, a new potential risk for us to, to get our heads around. Um, and we worked with uh, a group of other, uh, in this case, just UK investors. Uh, Web is, is small. Uh, some of these guys are very big. Together with these other um, investment businesses, we have about 150 billion pounds worth of money under management. So we're talking about quite sizable uh, investors. Threadneedle and Henderson in particular are, are two of the largest in the UK. So this isn't just a niche agenda. This is something that the mainstream care about as well. Um, and, and all of these businesses had uh, existing shareholdings in both Umicore and Johnson Matthey. And um, the sort of the, 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 the context, if you like, of the engagement is that I think long-term shareholders, and I, I mean in not all investors are long-term. In fact, the average time an investor holds a company on the, on the London Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange is less than a year. So most investors are investing for very short periods of time. But there are investors who hold companies for many years, uh, even decades, uh, of which um, this group would be uh, 
these companies would be uh, would very much represent that perspective. Uh, and we have an absolute, uh, uh, very real um, commitment to the success of the business. If, if they if they don't perform well, we lose money. Um, so we have a, a very clear alignment in terms of with management in terms of wanting to see commercial success from these companies. And we're not going to ask them to do things which we don't think are fundamentally in their long-term commercial interest. So I think that's an interesting point to make about the role that, that, that investors can play. The other thing is we also we invest in them because we see them as being um, well-placed to generate superior returns going forward. And so we, we, we're very optimistic about the future for these businesses. So we're coming from a very positive place, really, I guess, is the point I'm trying to make, where there is clear alignment with the management um, of these businesses. Um, and then the third thing to, to mention is that I, I didn't put my hand up then about the similarity <laughs> tool uh, because I don't think I will ever use it, but I would very much hope the companies we invest in will use it. Um, I, it's not our role to get involved in the detail of management of these businesses. That's for the management team. But our role is very much to think about strategy and positioning, governance, and overall risk management. And so um, we, we think it is our role to, um, to guide management uh, at a high level in terms of some of these issues, but not to get involved in the, in the sort of detail. Briefly now, if you would. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, so in terms of the, the, the outcomes of the, the work, we, we basically wrote to the, the two companies, we met with them, we sp spoke to them on the phone, uh, typically with the um, investor relations people and also uh, sustainability and environmental professionals. And it was clear to us, that four sort of key headlines really. The, fo the first was that the focus is very much on compliance with REACH. Um, you know, there's a huge amount of effort and time and energy that's gone into uh, properly implementing the regulation and, uh, and making sure that you know, all, the, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Um, but that is very much a very sort of compliance-oriented mindset. Um, there's this very clear distinction between hazard and risk, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, um, that you know, the companies are very clear that it's about risk and it's not about hazard, and I, clearly I think they're somewhere in between. Um, there is some evidence of this proactive stance of businesses, so the substitution, there is some evidence of that, but it tends to be very patchy, very ad hoc, driven by individual units within these businesses. Um, and the final conclusion, really, which perhaps is the most important, is that there didn't seem to be an overall sort of strategic positioning on this issue. And uh, this is just Umicore and Johnson Matthew, but I think it's probably true of the industry as a whole where this hasn't yet risen to the, the top of the pile in terms of issues that these companies need to deal with, and they haven't yet developed an overall strategic view on, uh, on what they need to do, um, in contrast to you know, something like climate change, which is so very much at the top of their agendas, and I, I think this issue is still further down the, um, the pecking order. Uh, we're beginning to see some of the changes uh, in that, and perhaps I can talk about that later. Yeah. But um, just to conclude, um, to summarize really what I've been saying, the first is that I think you know, the chemical industry has been on this rather long and, and frankly quite bumpy ride over the last few decades. I think we are beginning to come through and see the importance of the chemical industry as enablers of this <coughs> low carbon economy that we're all hoping that we can get to. Uh, institutional investors are increasingly engaged with companies on these and other sorts of longer term issues. And that the sin list and chemical substitution is increasingly on that on that list of issues as well. So this is just one small group of investors. There are others who've been engaged on this topic as well, um, and that we've we've started some early conversations with companies coming from the investor base around these issues and what we think they should be doing. But it's it's still early. Um, but I think there's enough evidence that it's a useful conversation that we will certainly be continuing our role. There is also a SIN producers list, uh, which lists companies that either produce or import uh, substances of very high concern. Is that useful? When you're raising awareness among investors of this issue more broadly, apart from the ones you're already working with, is that a useful tool, just to be able to see which companies are we talking about? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, we were, we were completely in the dark, I think, before, uh, before we had the SIN list and the SIN producers list that you mentioned. Um, and just being able to say, you know, Umicore have whatever it is, seven substances uh, on the list is, is a red flag for, for a lot of investors. 
Um, and the key audience as well, I mean, the investment community is very heterogeneous. There are all sorts of types of different investors. But the sell-side brokers, the, 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 the companies, the Goldman Sachs's, the Merrill Lynch's that are doing the research, they have the really deep expertise around the industry. And one of the things that we did with our, with our exercise that I didn't really talk about that much was to engage the sell side. So UBS, uh, you know, uh, Societe Generale now have analysts who are very much thinking about these issues.